firstly, I'd like to wish everybody here a good afternoon. My name is Clara Silva. I'm an exchange student here at Harvard, and I'm honored to present you Professor Edward Glazer. Um, professor Glazer is a professor of economics at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at Harvard. Um, he usually teaches microeconomics and also public and urban economics here. And he got his PhD from the University of Chicago and his BA from Princeton University. And he also published dozens of uh, articles, papers, and books on the de uh, economic development of cities and law and economics. So please, everybody, receive Professor Edward Glazer. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. What was not mentioned in that is my, my thesis advisor was Jose Alejandro Schenkman. And as such, I am completely a product of Brazil and am always enormously grateful to interact uh, and to learn from, from Brazil. Um, the second thing that, that uh, uh, I'd like to emphasize is much of my work involves cities. And we've just this semester released a free online course called Cities X, which has been done in partnership with Arc Futura in Sao Paulo. So there are, in fact, Portuguese subtitles if you are interested in, in doing them as well. In fact, we filmed in Rio de Janeiro and, and in Sao Paulo as, as well. We have a number of uh, Rio, of course, is notable for having by far the most visually attractive favelas in the world. So it's, it's absolutely, if you're, if, you're going to, if you're going to take movies of urban, urban hardship, it's hard to beat Rio in terms of, of getting the images. Uh, OK, so let me start with a portrait of urbanization across the world. And this, in some sense, is the backdrop for everything that I, I will talk about. What I have done here is I've taken the countries with per capita income below 5,000, I've grouped them by income levels, and the bars show the share of countries in each income group that is at least one third urban. Okay? So over here, over here, you see that in those countries with incomes between four and five thousand, more than eighty percent are more than one third urban today. Now the blue line shows what was true in 1960. In 1960, also about eighty percent of those countries are more than one third urban. Between three and four thousand. You have you know, about 80% of one-third urban today. Uh, an even higher percentage were more than one-third urban, urban 50 years ago. But go to the poorest countries of the world, those countries with per capita income below 2,000, below 1,000 pounds. What share of those countries below 1,000 were more than one-third urban in 1960? It's a very easy number to remember, right? Zero, not a one. Because in 1960, it has had been true throughout almost all of recorded history to be poor was overwhelmingly to be rural. Today, more than 40% of those countries are more than one-third urban. Go to countries with $1,000 to $2,000 per capita income. In 1960, one-fifth of them were more than one-third urban. Today, 60% are. Now, I continue to be optimistic about this trend. I believe there is no future in rural poverty. And indeed, the promise of growth and development will occur in cities. But it's important not to sugarcoat urbanization, right? There are also dangers, demons that come with density. And in some sense, it is the job of the law to make sure that our interactions in urban spaces are regulated, are safe. And they are safe for the weak as well as, as the strong. And dealing with these downsides of density, particularly in poor and sometimes in poorly governed countries, is in some cases the greatest, you know, one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. It's also a challenge where Brazil has the capacity to offer insight and information for the, the poorer parts of the world that are urbanizing today. So Brazil became 50% urban in 1964 uh, in, uh, at a time in which it was you know, significantly poorer than it is today and significantly poorer than the US was. So Brazilian per capita incomes in modern dollars were you know, $2,100, $2,200 back in 1964. Um, the US didn't become 50% urban until 1920, when our per capita incomes were over $7,000. That partially reflected the urbanization of Brazil in, 1960, in the 1960s, partially reflected the fact that you were importing a very large amount of food from Argentina during that time period. And it made it possible to urbanize before you had enough agricultural strength to, to create your own cities. And that, that story is a story that replays itself throughout the developing world today. That you can have, you know, Port-au-Prince grow in Haiti, not because Haiti can feed the residents of Port-au-Prince, but they can be fed with, great, with rice that comes out of New Orleans. The globalization of the world has made that urbanization possible. And that's, that's absolutely true. But consequently, Brazil, which is now, of course, a more urbanized country than the US, has been dealing with the challenges of urbanization, despite limited resources in many cases, for 50 years. And has done so with mixed results, but with many successes. 
And those successes are things that Africa needs to learn from today. And in fact, there's much more to be learned if you're thinking about Africa dealing with the problem of urbanization from Brazil than there is from London. Because it's 130 years since London dealt with these, with these issues as opposed to 30 years. Okay. Um, now, I argue, and I, I frequently have to make this, this case, that in fact I see the urbanization of the poor parts of the world as being fundamentally benign despite the challenges. One of the reasons for this is the incredibly strong correlation between urbanization and economic development. So over here I'm showing the relationship between urbanization in 1960 and per capita growth between 1960 and 2010. I'm not trying to suggest that this link is entirely causal, right? um, but I know of no pathway from poverty to prosperity that does not run through city streets. Right? And you can see that here. And across countries, if you compare those countries that are more than 50% urban to those countries that are less than 50% urban, the more urbanized countries have on average incomes that are five times as high and infant mortality levels that are less than a third. Okay? So I, I cannot tell you how often I end up in policymakers' offices where they say to me, great, you're an expert in city. Tell me how I stop all these poor people from coming to my city and screwing it up. Right? <laughs> that's that's you know, a, a ubiquitous conversation. And I just try over and over again to say, look, that's not the right answer. Right? I know it creates challenges. The job of the government is to figure out how to make the poor people coming less, less difficult, less challenging, not to try and shut them out. This is, um, uh, these are relationships between income and density within countries. And what I wanted to show here is that this is the US relationship between urban size and, and density. This is the Brazilian relationship. The things that we know from the US in terms of the relationship between urbanization and productivity appear to hold to exactly the same extent in Brazil, India, and China as well. The same power of cities to create productivity appears to go hold there. Now, um, perhaps the arch expositor of the anti-urban perspective was Mahatma Gandhi, who was right on many things. But you know, he famously remarked, I regard the growth of cities as an evil thing, unkind for, uh, unfortunate for mankind in the world. Now, I think on this one, he's almost assuredly wrong. Okay? Um, and it's not just about income. Because, of course, as you've noticed, Gandhi didn't care particularly about income. He thought that you know, hand spinning of, of you know, fabric was a great, was a great way to, to promote uh, something. Uh, uh, but it's also about quality of life. So what I'm showing you here is the difference. Each one of these dots represents a country, and it represents the difference between urban and rural happiness. So it's a survey, and we're asking people, how satisfied are you? I, I think the clip on is, is turned off. OK, okay sure. How about now? Yeah. Better? Yeah. OK. OK, great. Sorry for the technical difficulties. OK. Um, so. Uh, each one of these dots reflects the difference between urban happiness and rural happiness. The zero line means that the urbanites and the rural dwellers say that they're equally happy. If you're negative, the people who live in cities say that they're less happy. If it's positive, the people who live in rural areas are more happy. In wealthy countries, it's kind of a wash, okay? Basically, a cluster around the zero line. In Sweden, the people who live in cities say that they're a bit happier. I can't imagine how miserable rural Sweden is in uh, January or February. Uh, but, you know, New Zealand and Italy, the rural dwellers say that they're happier. You know, I mean, rural New Zealand, it's Lord of the Rings and all that. It's, it's, it's very nice. Um, but if you go to the poorest countries of the world, right, overwhelmingly the happiness data favors cities. And, of course, it is ironic that of all the countries in the world, the one that has the largest happiness gap that favors cities is, of course, Gandhi's own home country of India, okay, where the urbanites say that they are much happier than the rural dwellers. Um, and it's also true Mali, Ghana, Moldova, Rwanda, South Africa, Guatemala. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. So Iraq and Thailand are the most extreme examples. Now, this data comes from the 2005 to 2007 period where Iraq cities were experiencing certain adverse exogenous shocks, as we economists like to call bombs. Uh, the, um, the, the case of Thailand, I blame on the traffic in Bangkok. Uh, but uh, certainly by and large, and part of the problem is, you know, you look at a Mumbai slum or you look at a Rio favela, and you think, boy, this is a miserable existence. But you're benchmarking it against, the natural thing, of course, is to benchmark it against our own existence, right? Which is a silly thing for us to do. We have to benchmark it against the rural northeast of Brazil, where they, where, which was their alternative, right? And on almost every measure, life in a favela, no matter how tough it is, looks like a life of more hope than life in the rural northeast of Brazil, right? And we have a fair amount of data showing that, which suggests that, you know, the, the right answer is not to ship them back to the rural northeast of Brazil or to ship them back from Mumbai to rural India, but to figure out how to make the favelas to make them, uh, Mumbai uh, more livable. Now, this highlights the way I think about cities is as a triad, as having three layers. 
Okay? One of these layers is the economic magic of human interactions. And I'm, I'm going to talk less about this than I usually would in a talk to economists or, or business people. But it, it is the ability of cities to create collaboration that is their greatest asset. Right? And in some sense, it's remarkable that a world in which distance is dead, that urban interactions have remained so vital. But I think the right way to think about this is what globalization and new technologies have done is that they have radically increased the returns to being smart. They've radically increased the returns to innovation. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. It's what we do that actually uh, is most valuable. And the more complicated the world is, right, the more complex an idea is, the easier it is to get lost in translation, the more important face-to-face -face contact is. Right? I mean, anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to your students. Right? And we have evolved over millions of years to have these cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. Right? A more information intensive world is naturally a more urban world. Um, second, this is what I was talking about before, government battling the demons of density. Okay? So this is um, crime, contagious disease, Traffic congestion, right? How high housing costs, all of these things which go wrong when too many people move over a small area. One way to think about this is that an abundance of land hides many sins, that the failures of government become invisible when people are spread out along uh, enough distance. But when you cram them together, an underperforming public sector becomes painfully obvious to all. Um, third, the physical city. And I think it's really important that we never confuse the physical city for the real city, because the real city is the humanity, it's not the skyline. Right? And the skyline only matters insofar as it empowers and encourages the people who live in that area. But the skyline still matters. The infrastructure still matters. And um, you know, one of the things that I've fought hard against over the past 15 years is the tendency of many cities to overregulate their construction. And this is something that I worry about in the Brazilian context as well. It's not as extreme as Mumbai, which for 50 years has had 1.25 floor area ratios, which means the average height has to be 1.25, right? which just ensures that the city sprawls out rather than up and becomes dysfunctional. But I worry about it in the Brazilian context as well. Certainly, the doing business report on construction in Brazil did not suggest that, that you know, there's an easy regulatory environment that allows the things to get built to, to be built. Now, um, the backdrop for urbanization is, of course, always technological change. And new technologies have been shaping cities for you know, uh, a millennium or many millennium. The most important technology that has uh, shaped cities, I think, is this one. Because there is no more important job for city government than providing clean water, and aqueducts were actually crucial for doing this. Um, in the 19th century, we lived in an era in which technologies tended to be profoundly centripetal. Okay? So skyscrapers, which are the combination of a steel frame building with a safety elevator, right? those, are the, those are the two critical ingredients in a, in a skyscraper, enabled cities to soar up and enabled cities to, to come together. Of course, we don't typically think of Sao Paulo as being a, a city of skyscrapers. It's a city of high-rise dwellings, right? So I, I think by one measure, there are at least 6,000 buildings with 12, with 12 or more stories in Sao Paulo, which, which makes it absolutely, you know, only in East Asia do they have numbers that are comparable, uh, comparable to that. Um, in the course of the 20th century, technologies were profoundly centrifugal, meaning they pulled people away from cities. Cars above all, and of course America's early adoption of the automobile led to the great sprawl of America's uh, cities, but also radios and televisions, which meant that you didn't have to go downtown to get good entertainment. All of these moved away from cities. I think a lot, a lot of our current technologies are pulling people back in to get today. And one variant of this is what's called the sharing economy. Now, cities have always been about sharing. What is an urban uh, restaurant other than a shared dining room, a shared kitchen? Uh, what is an urban park other than a shared backyard? The difference is technology enables us to share more things. So Zipcar, for example. So I grew up in New York in the 1970s in a grittier time. And you, know, you can imagine sort of getting your Zipcar in New York in the 1970s. So you go to Times Square and you go to pick it up, and there'd be like a dead body in the the trunk, okay? And it'd be really unpleasant because you had to deal with a dead body in the trunk. Today, the technology means it's not going to be there, and so you can share it. And even, I think, even more extreme is the idea of Uber in the New York in the 1970s. The idea that there'd be like some driver who would come and you'd like get in the back of his car and he'd take you somewhere. I mean, it's a terrifying notion, right? Um, now, with the technologies, we do that all the time, and, and we think it's entirely safe. And in some sense, these technological changes have been centripetal. They, they've pulled us further in. 
you can see the centri centripetal nature of, of Yelp coverage uh, in, uh, this is a map of US Yelp coverage across the country. And you can see the areas that are dense, lots of people are sharing knowledge about restaurants. In areas that are not dense, you don't have Yelp coverage. This also means that we can use Yelp to get a picture of what's happening in cities. Okay? And some of my more recent research has been about trying to use big data to actually measure what's happening in urban spaces. This is particularly valuable in areas where you think the government statistics are weak, which actually means that big data is particularly valuable in the developing world. Um, so in the US, it's also true that if you want sub-city data, if you want below city data on what's happening in terms of demographic change or even businesses, you are at most three years out of date. Sorry, at best three years out of date. And if you want demographics, please, 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 if you want demographics, you're at least five years out of date. The census does not allow you to get a clear picture of what a neighborhood looks like in any year after 2013 today. Right? But with Yelp data, I have images. I, have, I know exactly what's going on with Yelp right, right now. So we did a bunch of different things with, with various Yelp things. So the first thing we asked was we followed the CEO of Zillow who asked whether or not, uh, whether or not Starbucks predicts housing prices. So um, the CEO of, of Zillow said, well, you know, the, they, they produced this result. So we went in and, and looked at this, whether or not Starbucks was a, was a good prediction. It turns out that it actually is. It turns out that it strongly predicts housing, housing prices across areas. And even though Yelp predicts Star Starbucks predicts uh, housing prices, and that's what you're seeing here, um, it's not true that housing prices predict Yelp. Now, I don't think this is because people are willing to pay for proximity to Starbucks so much, but it's that Starbucks happens to be very adept at forecasting which areas will gentrify. Okay? So in some sense, this Starbucks density is one thing that you can use to ask yourself, is an area uh, gentrifying? It turns out you can do this with lots of different things. Uh, so uh, these are various variables. This is just in New York City uh, in terms of Yelp reviews that change the number of groceries, change the number of cafes, bars, restaurants, barbers, wine bars, all of which predicts these are various demographics that you might be interested if you wanted a picture of the gentrification of a city. Okay, you wanted to know whether or not which areas are gentrifying. This is change in the share that are college educated, change in the share of 25 to 34, change in percent white. And as you can see, a lot of them have a fair amount of predictive power in terms of explaining which, which areas are gentrifying. Now, it's sort of interesting to see which ones really predict this stuff. So groceries are very predictive. Cafes, that, that seems reasonable. Barbers, wine bars, certainly. What's going on with laundromats, right? Everyone know what a laundromat is. It's one of these grim places that you go and you put your laundry in the, in the thing and you wait for it. Not exactly what you think of as like the yuppie you know, event of the, of the future, right? <laughs> so I, I, now some part of it is that the rapidly gentrifying areas of New York are in places like Brooklyn where you actually don't have good laundromats in the area, so that's one thing. But I think there's something else that's important when we think about Yelp reviews. It's not a particularly yuppie thing to go to a laundromat, but then to go online afterwards and to write a review about that laundromat, <laughs> that's got to be somebody special who thinks writing reviews of laundromats is a really good thing. And uh, no one with a great deal of common sense, I think, would necessarily be applied to say, oh, the machines were very nice. Oh, they did not. <laughs> um, uh, now, one of the things that we've done, which I think is even more interesting and, and potentially even more usable in, in the developing world, is using, uh, actually quantifying the physical landscape change. And this, this starts with the work of Celeste Schechter and Hidalgo, which has nothing to do with me. Um, and what they do is they take images from Google Street View, and they ask people online which one looks safer. Okay? And they have 4,000 images from the most representative and important cities in the world, New York, Boston, Linz, and Salzburg. Uh, I have no idea what led them to Linz and Salzburg, which, you know, <laughs> unless you are a Mozart fanatic, you would not come up with these things being there. But this is what they did. They got 8,000 unique participants from 91 countries, and they rated more than 200,000 pairwise comparisons. Now, so with this, they get these rankings. Now, you should think of this as actually asking which places look nicer, not which places are safer. Because, in fact, the areas where people say they look safer are not actually safer. And, you know, you can figure out why. Right? So look at this area. Who's going to go there? Okay? There's no crime there. Who's going to go on a Friday night and say, boy, this is where I want to hang out. This, I'm going to wait until somebody comes and murders me. No, nobody goes there, so there's no crime. There was this. It looks kind of nice, but you actually do have some people who go there and some people who get robbed when they go there. So it doesn't correlate very well with, with safety, but it is a measure of how attractive the neighborhood looks. Now, the next step is the computer scientist Nikhil Naik, who um, is my co-author on this, who, with, along with uh, Cesar Hidalgo, uh, is looking at um, taking the, the blocks that were based on people's reviews online, based on these people online ranking them. And then you take this data, take these ranked street blocks, and you use computer vision techniques to reproduce individual judgments using a computer algorithm. 
Okay, so it starts with these 4,000 images that you know, people have rated, which in the case of New York gives you 1,700 city blocks. And then you train the computer to duplicate that. And then all of a sudden you have ratings on a million blocks. And it turns out the computer can do a pretty good job of, imp of imitating what people do. It involves a whole lot of fancy computer science that, quite honestly, I don't understand at all. Okay? Uh, but the, there are these tools for reducing the dimensionality. And then you get a street score for everywhere. And you can do this pretty much any place you want to. Um, what areas correlate with perceived safety, with looking nice? Well, density. Right? Density correlates very strongly with this. Education correlates very strongly with it. Um, income, somewhat less strongly. Share of, of family households correlates strongly with it. Um, and you can also use this for charting neighborhood change. So this is the change in street score between 2007 and 2014. So we've had studies where we've actually looked at the demographic change in neighborhoods before, but never once in which we could actually physically measure the changing nature of the streetscape, of what it looked like. Right? Um, and what, you, what we learned from this is the places that had the most upgrading, and this is done across six cities in the US, uh, the places that had the most upgrading were places that were initially well-educated, that were initially denser. Actually, the places that started looking nicer had the most upgrading in, in being nice. Places that were close to the city center, so think Tribeca in New York, if, if you know that, places that were sort of unattractive historically but got richer because of proximity to the city center, they, those places did better. Places that were near other areas that were rich or nice or attractive, in some sense, quality invaded. Right? There's an old Chicago School of Sociology view about how sort of poverty invades across neighborhoods. Well, as cities were getting richer over the last 20 years, it was gentrification that invaded right? and invaded slowly oozing across, across space. Um, so this is, uh, wait, what happened here? Uh, okay, so this is what we're doing in terms of measuring, uh, measuring this, this stuff. And we can do more things in terms of measuring, uh, trying to evaluate house, housing prices. We can deal with property tax assessments by measuring, by using this. You can use these images to map out wealth and poverty because the places where poor people li live uh, look different than the places that rich people live. I will say the one really interesting thing, we tried to do this in uh, Chile where we had income data and we tried to ask, can we, can we map, figure out income and poverty? You really can do this very well within New York and Boston. You can actually really figure out which areas are rich and poor by the images. In Chile, it worked much less poorly. And I think the answer was you could spot the very rich and you could spot the very poor, but there was a broad middle income in the Chilean income dis in distribution where everyone looked like they were living in exactly the same places. And maybe its ostentation is a luxury good. But in fact, if you're actually trying not to look rich, if you're trying to drive a cheap car so no one will target you, if you're trying not to have a house that's fancy, it then becomes harder to actually pick off wealth and poverty from the streets. Uh, OK, uh, now um, let me move now to the, the next point, which I think is the, the, you know, what I'm going to talk, be talking about going forward, is the demons that come with density, so the downsides. And this is really where law comes in, is dealing with these, these downsides. Now, as I suggested, the, the most important thing that city governments do is around clean water. Okay? And um, that's because of you know, this, this graph. So what this graph shows is it shows death rates in New York City over the past 200 years. A boy born in New York City in 1900 could expect to live six years less than the national average for the, for the US. Okay? It's about the same life expectancy gap between Shakespeare's London and the rest of England in, in Tudor England. Okay? Um, cities have historically been killing fields. People have usually died there, and it's usually because of contagious disease. Um, and you can see that here, right? You see the spikes from cholera going forth in, in various things. Now, um, the, the story that I was told, the story that I was reared on for understanding this, was one of engineering triumphalism. That, in fact, the critical thing was investing in large amounts of water-based infrastructure. And that's, on one level, absolutely true. America's cities and towns were spending on, uh, on much as water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. But on another level, that's false. And that's where the law comes in. OK. Um, the, the great piece of infrastructure here is the Croton Aqueduct, which you see was, was built in 1842. Right? Look at this graph. Does anyone see a break in 1842? Anyone see something where, where suddenly the uh, death rates plummet? No. New York is having cholera epidemics for another quarter century. My great, 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 great grandfather died in this one in the 1849 cholera epidemic in New York City. Um, and the reason why uh, was that New York suffered from the same thing that many developing world cities do today from the last mile problem. In fact, you built this water infrastructure, and you still expected people to pay for the connections, and they didn't pay. Right? I do work in Lusaka. Uh, this, this is water infrastructure in Lusaka, where they have nice international agencies that build water mains. And then they say, if you want to connect to this water main, it's 1000 bucks. 
okay? And per capita income in Zambia is less than $2,000, so $1,000 connection seems expensive. Um, in New York City in the 1900s, they had free water hydrants, which you could go to, but there were only about 1,000 of them in Manhattan, so you'd have to carry the water, and water's heavy to carry. And so poor people didn't connect, and uh, they didn't start getting healthy until they actually, uh, actually invested in, uh, they started forcing people to change. Now, um, let me go back to the, uh, the thing. So this is really the key change, is the Board of Health comes in, and they start imposing fines on tenement owners who don't connect. Okay? They start saying it's against the rules not to connect, and we're going to punish you if you don't connect. Now, New York, remember, was overwhelmingly a city of renters, so that made things easier. In 1890, 95% of the residents of New York were renters. So you can impose this rule on the tenement owners, on the landlords, and it made it somewhat easier politically. Um, you sent in guys, like I'm just showing you a picture, this is, this is the guy, okay? This is the kind of inspector. And you, when you think about this type of intervention, you worry about two types of dangers, right? You, you worry about the possibility of, you know, uh, extortion of the, of the innocent and corruption of the guilty. Both of these are real. Um, the way, one of the ways they bypassed this was that these inspectors were not part of the municipal police. So they wouldn't be part of like the, in, in, in a Brazilian country, they wouldn't be part of either the military or the civilian police. They were separate and responsible to doctors, okay, which made things slightly better. The other thing that's really important in the New York context, which makes it hard to use this in the case of, you know, Mumbai, is that one of the things that you had critically is 800 years of land-based jurisprudence in the common law countries that meant you knew who owned the land. Okay, and the fact that you knew who owned the land made it possible to impose rules on that land, right? And this is a simple lesson, right? Defining property rights can be a big part of making cities livable, right? Uh, this is the equivalent of the German Constitution, Article 14, German Basic Law. Property entails obligations. You should also serve the public interest, right? So own, knowing who owns the property is sort of a critical part of actually imposing requirements on them like you connect to the water. Um, I will just say one more thing about, uh, I'm going to spare you this, this thing. In, in Zambia, um, one of the big problems is not just the, the failure to connect. It's when you do connect, the water lines break all the time. So you don't have water at, during, during dark hours, period. You only have them during daytime hours. But you have a huge fraction of the days in which it breaks. And not only is it about in incentives for connecting, it's also about the institutions that provide water. And one of the things that's really fascinating from our Zambian data is the places where they s have supply issues are places where people pay by the month rather than paying by the amount of water. So when the water company gets paid based on the amount of water that flows, it fixes the water pipes. When it gets paid by the month, it doesn't. Okay? It's exactly what Economics 101 would predict would happen. And thinking through the incentives related to the institutions around cities are really, really important. Um, I'm going to skip over this uh, and you know, move forward on, uh, on this. So I, I want to talk a little bit about how thinking about the property rights agenda around cities in, in the developing world. And, and a lot of this is very specifically around land. So this point about you know, property rights and knowledge of ownership is critical for actually enforcing rules. Um, that's one part. Um, but obviously, you know, we have DeSoto who promises us that you know, it, it, ownership of property will uh, unlock all sorts of millions of, uh, of entrepreneurs who will do magical things. Uh, we have Erica Field's superb essay, which shows that when you gave people property rights over their land in Peru, they wasted less time staying at home protecting their, their, their land. Um, and uh, I think my, my friends in Africa worry mostly about property rights enabling there to be reallocation of land. So you have slums that are very close to the city center that are seen as being incredibly inefficient. Maybe there's a deal where all of their, their lives can be made better off, but they're moved to someplace, be, someplace is better. Now, with a little bit of a, of a Latin American perspective, it's easy to remember how that can go wrong, right? The city of God was exactly that vision. Right? It's exactly a vision that we're going to move people away from the city center. We're going to reallocate goods, you know, reallocate land in a way that's efficient, and we're going to get it monstrously wrong. So uh, I think it is, you know, once again, the sort of Latin ex American experience is very helpful for thinking about the cities of, of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I think more importantly, any land and property reform has to in, in respect institutional reality. So this is just the point that, you know, when you have weak property rights, you have less investment in, less returns to investment than you have when you have strong property rights. This is something that everyone worries about in terms of land ownership in the developing world, that when you don't have, you don't own your slum, you don't invest in it. Um, I think one of the things that's very important, and, and it's, it's, I, I, I want to just emphasize that, you know, having a bunch of lawyers think about this is really crucial. As you all know, right, when we talk about property rights, it's a bundle of rights. It's not one particular right. It's a bundle of rights. And yet, 
when you talk to the, the property rights aficionados, what they are interested in is cadastres. What they are interested in is something that makes sure that the fact that you own this property is well known. That has nothing to do with the right of alienation. Right? It has nothing to do with man managing how you would deal with this land in a contract setting. It just is that you own this land in, on your own. And um, this, so for example, let me give you an example of where that goes, that could go awry. So you might think that we were efficient moving from a world in which you currently owned and, and lived that land to a world in which you rented out large amounts of it. Right? Renting is a contract that arises a totally different set of, of you know, property rights than just the ability to sit on your land and be sure that no one's going to steal it from you. And yet India may work towards you know, a, a clear property rights definition around owning the land, but their rental rules are a disaster. Right? You can never raise the rents. You can never evict anyone. And so you know, none of these rental markets that help make the cities that, of the Western world work can thrive in India, a, a world overwhelmingly of renters. A lot of the cases, I think of these property rights as being around the adoption of multiple technologies. Very often in the developing world, you see side by side uh, you know, two technologies, a rich technology and a poor technology. This is an example from Johannesburg, where you have these jitneys, right, which are, you know, small, cheap, run by, you know, residents, right, um, dangerous, and they typically wait to get filled up before they take off. They don't run on a fixed schedule, right, um, versus the gow train, right, which is slick, fancy, you know, expensive, built, you know, by and for white people, right. I mean, the, the two technologies coincide. One of the biggest questions for us to think about in terms of developing world cities is when is the right answer to improve the gal train? Oh, sorry, is to improve the, these jitneys? When is the right answer to move them to the gal train, right? And to do a, do a cheaper, cheaper gal train. Now, in transportation, this shows up all the time. When is the right answer to take the minibus fleets and make them better or to introduce bus rapid transit, for example, which is a little bit more like that. In the case of, see if I have a housing picture. In the case of housing, right, when is the right example? This is Kibera. Right, to think about upgrading this, to do things with prefabricated plastic slums, for example, do housing in containers. There are a variety of cheaper ways to make Kibera better. Or when is the right level to move to large, ultra-dense rental housing? Right? It's, I'm not trying to say there's one right answer. There isn't. In fact, I would argue that almost surely in the case of sewers, where your two technologies are a proper sewer system versus pit latrines, most of the time the answer is to get people actually on, on proper sewers. In the case of housing, it's much less clear. Right? In the case of, of trains, if my only answer is a big fancy train, almost assuredly I want to get those little minibuses to be safer and more effective. So I don't think there's one answer. Let me actually give you uh, an answer in the world of law that you see around you a lot of times. So you can either have a fancy bureaucratized police system or you can pay a bunch of local kids to watch over your house while, on Saturday night, right? which is the, the township model in, in Johannesburg. Two technologies. I mean, you know, one's a lot cheaper than the other, uh, but both coexist at the same time. Now, strength by property rights enable those things to work. So think about, oh, we're going to ratchet up the rent, rent uh, the strength of uh, property rights. So the first is we're going to allow use but not sale. Okay, so we're going to protect your right to use. You're not going to be, have it expropriated from you. Um, that's going to lead to better investment by owners for the owners, but it's not going to lead to reallocation, and it's not going to lead to large-scale rental markets. Then let's say we're going to allow you to sell. We're going to make it easy for you to sell. We're going to have a strong enough property market so that you're not going to have to worry about, about being expropriated in sale. That's going to allow better residential matching, but it's not going to allow large investment in rental units. And then finally, if you have property rights that allow rent and land assembly, then you can have the large structures. Then you can have this versus that. Okay? So you have a hierarchy of property rights that enable different forms of transformations. And it's sort of critical to think about what you do in the world of law as being intimately related to the physical side, which is impossible without the law to support it. Right? And, and that's really critical. And, and I just want to sort of emphasize the sale problem. Let me see if I have a, um, a sale thing. No, the sale, the sale thing. So let's say, let's say your or the mortgage problem. Um, so let's say you have, you have a clear right to own the house. But let's say we, have, we can easily imagine a property rights regime where as soon as I start to interact with you and you are a big, strong local guy, Right? Then all of a sudden we find that you've agreed to sell me your house. I've agreed to sell you my house for pennies on the, on the dollar, and there's nothing I can do about it. We've signed some sort of a contract there that I can't do anything about. It. Or even more so, you're, you're, you're a DeSoto aficionado. You're a relatively poor guy living in the outskirts of uh, Sao Paulo. You've taken out a mortgage on your area. Nine months in, the bank has declared you're three months short on your mortgage, and they're going to take your, take your land. Right? The best cadaster in the world, you know, and you have paid your mortgage, or maybe you haven't, you missed one month or something like that. The best cadaster in the world doesn't save that. 
right? Because you know you didn't know how to keep records, you weren't sure on how to keep records. The bank is powerful, you're weak, you get expropriated, right? So you know it's important as we think about these bundle of bundle of property rights to recognize that sort of the simple things that the World Bank is focused on, you know, the cadastres, the who owns what, don't necessarily fix a lot of the uses that we have for land, and that's that's I think really essential. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, okay, um, yeah, I, I, I so. I'm going to skip over this. Um, one of, the, one of the, 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 the critical things as we think about law and economics, law and property rights in the developing world, is to remember that, that these, you know, in the US, the world of law and economics was defined in a world in which we thought that all judges were completely trustworthy. In fact, there's an odd asymmetry in uh, American political discourse, which is people who say that they're libertarians are terrified of anything coming out of the executive or legislative branch, but they think anything coming out of the courts is good, right? It's a very odd thing, and it comes from a very strong faith in the judicial system in, in the US. Um, it's, I think, ridiculous if you think about law and economics in the developing world to think that we should, can assume that you know, it's the law that determines every judicial outcome. So this is surveys from the World Justice Project, which I love, which just asks, these are experts' assessment of the share of cases in which they've interacted with, which the poor have been treated unfairly. So you know, in rich parts of the world, in Norway, it's basically zero. Finland is zero. And then the poorer you go, the higher share of, of cases in which people think the, that the decisions are being made against, against poor. The poor, this is another way of taking this, right? The popular perception of undue influence over judges. So um, Brazil ranks actually pretty highly on this. About 60% of the, of the cases these judges think have been done with undue influence. Uh, Brazil, it's nice to see it's about 50-50, but maybe private interests, they think private interests are more powerful than public interests here. Uh, Mexico, again, private interests slightly more powerful. Look at China. China, you know, 80%, 80% of the, the, the cases the experts think were, were not decided according to the law, but were due to influence. But there's overwhelmingly the public sector. They're not afraid of the private sector whatsoever. And it's really important as we think about legal regimes to think about subversion of justice. We, we don't occupy a world in which we can necessarily count on all the courts to function perfectly. And we need to have rules that are relatively subversion free, that are relatively less likely to, to um, uh, suffer from subversion. So let me make this case in the context of property ownership and use. And this is a, from a paper that's joint with Andre Schleifer and Giacomo Ponsetto. Um, and I want to talk about an ancient legal question, which is the use of liability rules versus property rules and injunction. Okay? Um, so we've got a, a, a mine. You, you own some land. You're some relatively you know, poor farmer somewhere in Peru. You've got a mine that's polluting your land. right? And we can think about two legal remedies for you. One of which is you can go to the court and demand a li liability judgment against the, the polluter, in which the court will assess some, some amount of damages that they think that the, that the polluter has done. The polluter will have to then pay it to you. The other which is you can go and what we call a property rule, which is also you know, could be described as an injunction, injunctive relief. You're going to go and you're going to demand that the court's going to stop you from, stop them from doing them. Okay? And if the, the polluter doesn't do it, they suffer potentially criminal penalties. Right? There are many different examples of this. So for example, if if I, you steal wood from my property, okay, you're not, you're not particularly subject to liability rules. You've actually committed a criminal act that's independent of, and your punishment is independent of the value of the, of the wood that you, you've done. Now, I want you to think about these two different rules in an era of subversion. So if you have liability, the great thing is it allows exchange even if two people aren't there to exchange. So if I'm not there, you're gonna, you have to run across my area and damage it a little bit to get to your sick child. You're going to make the right outcome, make the right decision, because the liability rule is going to create a price. Right? So that's the really good thing about liability rules. And that's why the law and economics literature has been loved liability rules for the past 40 years. But the bad thing about liability rules is that liability rules are much more subject to subversion. Okay? So the mine comes in. It does $50,000 worth of damage to my, to my mine. And I go before a court and say, look, this mine did $50,000 of damage. Now, I'm just some poor landowner in rural Brazil, and they have some fancy lawyers who know the judge. And they say, no, 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 they did $500 worth of damage. And the judge says, yes, because after all, as we've just seen, 80% of cases are decided against, against the poor. So the liability rule ends up screwing the poor guy. Now, the poor guy may still be screwed if they have a property rule, if they have injunctive relief. But the rule is less factually intense. right? It's much easier to say, look, he's on my property. Get him off than it is to say how he did $50,000 worth of damage to me. The more factually intense the, the remedy, the more liable it is to subversion. And that's sort of a central point. And these strong, simple property rules are there to protect the weak. Right? They're there because the more complicated the rule is, the more likely it is to be subverted. And uh, the point is that as we think, you know, this is, this is a, a table that comes from it, the, the, the more likelihood that you get bargaining 
right, the more likelihood that you want property rules. So the sort of logic of Ronald Coase tells us that you know, if you, as long as you have clear property rules and as long as it's easy to bargain, you're fine. Okay? The case for liability rules is when it's hard to bargain. But here, liability rules fall down, fall down when the potential taker, when the potential polluter, is able to uh, subvert justice. Um, there are a bunch of related points. So in the world of eminent domain, which is a big urban topic, liability is equivalent to the courts establishing a fair market price. The equivalent for property is that any taking must be approved by perhaps a supermajority of the, of the residents. So this is, for example, the Indian structure where you have two thirds of the population that need to sign off before you have a, have a taking. The more you're afraid of public subversion, the more you like the supermajority rules relative to the other rules. Um, contracts, the usual the debate is between specific performance and damages. Okay, so specific performance, which is something usually the common law courts don't do, says that you actually, if you agree to do something for me, I'm going to make you, the court's going to make you do it. Li liability damages says that you have to pay me for failing to perform. Usually courts don't like to enforce uh, specific performance, but in fact, one of the most famous examples in Western law of subversion of justice and, and the downside of damages is the famous PV House case, which was a contracts case where you know, uh, pollution occurred and the damages were, were pushed down to, to a negligible amount. Um, if you have um, damages which are subject to this subversion, it's going to push us to contracts only between people who are equal in their legal power. Right? It's going to create symmetric. If I bargain with another weak guy, I'm OK, but I can't do bargains with strong guys. And that's, that's basically what happens when you have these things. Interestingly, I, I, um, some of my work, I work on, on Zambian entrepreneurs and markets who engage in, uh, they, have the mar they have these informal market chiefs who enforce contracts, and they actually do specific performance. They tell guys, look, if you don't, you promise this guy to do something. If you don't do it, I'm going to bust your head open unless you do it. So you got it. So you got to do it. So they actually revert to this. Um, uh, let me say a couple of last. Let's see what else I have in this. Uh, two last points, and then I'll, then I'll be quiet. So when we think about urban building, um, there are really two dangers for cities to get into. One of which I've already mentioned, which is opposition to building, excess regulation, or not in my backyardism. The poster child for this is Mumbai. Right, artificially restrictive rules. Much of the you know, uh, Anglo-Saxon world suffers from this. There's a, there's a rival danger, which is monumentalism, which is building for the sake of building. There's an argument that Brasilia is perhaps an example of, of monumentalism. Uh, certainly, there are many cities in China which are built for not particularly good reasons. Um, and you know, this is Astana, which there's no justification for it whatsoever. Um, the point on nimbyism is this, that you know, there's no repealing the laws of supply and demand. So along the x-axis shows the amount of building across American cities. Along the y-axis shows the price. And here we do price re relative to the physical cost of construction. And the point of this is the places that build a lot aren't expensive. And the places that are expensive don't build a lot. Right? If you want to promote affordability in Rio and Sao Paulo, you need to make sure that it's easy enough for, for builders to build. Right? There's, no, there's no way to avoid that. Last point, and this is, this is sort of meant to be a little bit fun. Uh, cities are often depicted as being the enemy of the environment. Right? And um, you know, we, we sort of think about um, you know, cities as being brown and, and nature as being green. And I think the opposite is true. That in fact, cities are actually friends to the environment. I like to tell this story by telling the story of a young Harvard College graduate who in a beautiful spring day in 1844 went for a walk in the woods outside of Cambridge. And he did a little fishing, and the fishing was good because they hadn't had much rain lately. But when he came to cook the fish into a fish soup, into a chowder, the wind flicked the flames to the nearby dry grass. And a fire started, and it spread. And by the time it was done, it was a raging inferno that had destroyed more than 400 acres of prime woodland. In his own day, this young man was castigated as an enemy of the environment. His local newspaper called him a flibberty gibbet. How do you translate flibberty gibbet into Portuguese? Uh, a, a, a flibberty gibbet, which is, which is uh, you know, pretty bad for 1844. And I have trouble thinking of anyone they were, who did as much damage to the environment as he did. Oddly, today, he is revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. His name is Henry David Thoreau. And he wrote a book that is beloved by environmentalists about what wonderful thing it is to live surrounded by nature. Well, clearly, it may have been wonderful for Thoreau to live surrounded by nature. It was not so wonderful for nature to live surrounded by Thoreau, uh, <laughs> as indeed you know, a whole natural ecosystem would have been survived if he hadn't gone out there. Now, there's a point of this, which is we are a destructive species, right? even on our best days. And often, the best way to take care of nature is to stay away from it, as indeed Thoreau would have done a great deal of good. Now, there's a, this, is, this is Thoreau, of course. This is the, now, um, this is a map, uh, together with Matthew Kahn of USC. We've tried to estimate carbon emissions 
holding income and family size constant in different parts of America. And the point is that the places that look green are brown and the places that look brown are green. And this is coming primarily from driving much longer distances when density is lower and living in much larger houses. And I started learning this personally when I started acquiring small children about 12 years ago. Uh, I moved from about here, a few blocks away from here, to about here, not so far away from Thoreau's Lake, and started doing about as much damage to the environment as Thoreau did. Um, what with the driving and the home heating and all that, all that other, other stuff. And um, the point of this is that you know, if the great growing economies of India and China see their carbon emissions levels rise to the scene in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions rise by 130%. If they rise at the level seen by, by wealthy but hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 30%. We all have a lot to gain by building up rather than building out in terms of, in terms of, of urbanization and the environment. And that is a challenge, and law is a big part of that challenge. Because dealing, particularly, I'm emphasizing today the law around land, but everything involving dealing with disputes around neighbors is an issue for law. And cities are full of both the positive interactions, they're full of the things that the great English economist was writing about 120 years ago, when he wrote that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as, as it were, in the air. But they're also filled of negative ones, right? If two people are close enough to give each other an idea or to say hello, they're also close enough to exchange a disease, right? And dealing with negative interactions is at the heart of law. It's at the heart of law. It's trying to manage human interactions in a way that we don't damage each other. So this is why you know, it is absolutely crucial that thinking forward, we need a greater involvement of lawyers in transforming cities. And we particularly need a greater involvement of Brazilian lawyers in thinking about urbanization and the challenges of urbanization globally. So thank you very much for your, for your time. Professor, um, we have some questions here. Of um, course. I think we have time for one or two, so um, I'm going to read the, the most voted one. So, should developing countries like India, for example, be allowed to pollute as much as they want in order to develop economically? Should they be allowed to? I, I, I didn't know that I was allowed to tell India how much to pollute uh, or not. Um, you know, Larry Summers got himself in a lot of trouble 30 years ago when he suggested that uh, India should be paid and allowed to do more pollution in, in there. Look, I mean, I, I'm, I, it's, it's hard. It's so I think one answer is that it's very hard for it's the Thomas Schelling line for a, a nation that drives SUVs like the US to tell a nation that drives bicycles, right, that they're not allowed to move into mopeds. Right? So uh, it's very hard as an American uh, to have any moral righteousness whatsoever in terms of telling India how much to, to pollute versus not. Certainly, one hopes that India pollutes less. But from a global carbon emissions point of view, just putting, you know, this is a very hot and humid country. Just going on air conditioning is going to put a huge drain on, on carbon emissions. But who are we to say that Indians can't enjoy the right to air conditioning that is you know, seen as being as American as apple pie? So the key is figuring out some way so that they can get rich without doing as much damage to the environment as we did. And um, I, I mean, I, I don't know, should, should doesn't make, doesn't, doesn't, I mean, I, I don't know how to say should one way or the other, but, but I hope we can figure out ways for the poorer parts of the world to become wealthy and to live wealthy world lifestyles and do less, less damage than we did. And the last question. So um, you mentioned some problems that urbanization entails, such as gentrification, and how can we use regulation to fix some of these issues? Well, I, I don't know about, I, I don't obviously see gentrification as being a curse. So just to be clear, I mean, I think there are ups and downs of gentrification. And in some sense, you're, you're always going to expect areas which aren't growing a lot, and there's a lot of demand for that to, for rich people to be outbidding poor people for space. Um, that's unfortunate, but it's, it's very hard to say that you're going to be completely against that. The key is, I think, the best weapon against the downsides of gentrification is to make sure the city is building enough housing that can actually accommodate poor people. So you know, we, we're not looking at an area in which we're, we're facing a zero-sum competition between rich and poor, but there's plenty of new space that can allow anyone and so that people can come to the, come to the area. Um, uh, in terms of regulation, uh, and so I mean, I would, I, would, I would see actually the best weapon against the downsides of, re of gentrification is actually deregulation, not increased regulation. I mean, I would like to see Boston permit more, particularly middle-class housing, rather than, rather than trying to use uh, regulation of it. On the other hand, just to be clear, you know, there's some types of urban regulation that I am deeply hostile to. To, take, to give you my favorite example in the, in the you know, American urban areas, I am a you know, crusader for deregulating food trucks. 
So, you know, I think it's, you know, I have eaten in a food truck, you know, in the outside of Litauer for, you know, as, as often as I can over the last 26 years since I taught here. They're a great example of urban entrepreneurship and urban creativity. They allow people who are, you know, maybe not so wealthy to get started doing something, so they're great. Often they are overregulated, and I'll, I'll give you a great example. There was a woman who wanted to start her food truck outside of, in Detroit, and she became a cause celebrity because for 18 months she tried to start a food truck, and the regulations just said no. Okay? Now, the idea that Detroit is saying no to any entrepreneur that wants to get started <laughs> is just insane. Okay? Um, uh, uh, but you know, there, those were the rules. And I was on a, a national public radio show with this, with this woman and with the ombudsman, the, the city representative of the city of Detroit. And you know, this poor guy who's representing Detroit, is being, he's being beaten up by her, he's being beaten up by the callers, he's being beaten up by me, he's being beaten up by the host, right? For a solid hour, he's being nothing but this poor representative of Detroit, who's not his rules, but he's, he has to defend, he's just being beaten up. And at the end of the time, he says, oh lady, just go ahead and start your food truck. We'll never catch you. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, so regulation around, around food trucks, less regulation around building, you know, probably less, although you do need some. You need safety standards, for sure. You need, you need stuff that's about, about uh, um, but, you know, regulation around water, regulation around clean water, I mean, where there are clear externalities, sure. I mean, it's not, it's not like there's like a one right, so I just wanted, wanted to get it clear. There are some areas where I think clearly cities do regulate too much, but there are other areas in which cities could regulate more. And you know, when you heard me talk about the sort of New York, New York issue, what, what the New York City Board of Health did is they imposed a regulation on tenement owners, which were you actually had to connect to the, to the sewers. And I think that was a good thing. I mean, and you see that in the death data that comes after that. So you, know, you want regulations that are correctly targeted. And you also, and this is sort of the really critical thing, you want laws and regulations that are less vulnerable to subversion. Right, that are less vulnerable to the subversion that comes from corrupt cops who are going to try and extort people about it, that are less vulnerable to, um, uh, to private subversion. And in the case of regulations, let me just give a clear example of you know, just how worried I am about cops. Now, Brazil doesn't suffer from this issue, but it's an Indian issue, which is open street defecation. So kids, kids going to the bathroom in the middle of the, the, middle of the street. Um, it's, a, it's a big issue, and it's not an issue that can be solved by just more public latrines, because you put in the latrines and the kids still defecate in the street. Okay? Um, uh, in the West, uh, I mean, the normal way we'd handle this is by punishing them, right? That, you know, this is a bad thing, you're going to punish them. So uh, I think we should punish the kids who do that. But I want to do a punishment that doesn't actually hurt them and not one that's subject to abuse. So my proposed punishment is kids who defecate in the street have to do 90 minutes of math problems in the local community center, <laughs> right? Or maybe they have to read something, you know, of, of Indian history, or maybe they have to do something else. But something that actually doesn't actually harm the kids, actually helps them. The kids still see them, at least if they're anything like my kids, as hell. Okay, so you know, doing math problems for 90 minutes would be seen as being a very stark punishment in much of in much of the, even though it's not actually harmful, and also it's very unlikely to lead to abuse, right? I can't see a world in which a corrupt cop would say oh, say to like the kid's parents, oh, you know, if you if you pay me enough, you know, I'll let you I'll let your kid out of having to do his math problems. You know, that's not going to happen. So you know, it, it, the the point is that sort of contrary to the logic of you know the classic law in economics, is you want large penalties with low probabilities of, of arrest. You know, in the case of you know, corrupt or potentially corrupt situations, you need really small penalties that are really not likely to be lead to arrest, that are ideally enforced by a separate police system that can be focused on just these quality of life, quality of life things. So I think I better, I better stop now, but I want to invite you to join in this vocation of trying to make the cities of the developing world better in, in the century ahead. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you.